Okay, so exiting Bowman's capsule, what do we encounter first? What's the next structure? The proximal uh, to what usually, what's the big things that happen there? Everything, yeah. Uh, the main thing? Sodium reabsorption is a big one. Then we move into the loop of Henley where we can concentrate the urine. What big drugs work there? The loop of Henley. And then we have, then we have the ascending uh, part of that loop. Uh, and eventually moves into the distal tubule, and the distal tubule moves into the collecting duct. So what you might notice about the collecting ducts is that multiple nephrons feed into those. And so if you have problem in one collecting duct, multiple nephrons are affected. Okay. All right, very good. Okay. All right. So you've already uh, you've already have listed or already mentioned the two major causes of acute uh, kidney injury: pre-renal uh, disease and acute tubular necrosis. Acute ATN is probably the more more common, and then post uh, obstructive being the least common. And so post obstructive causes uh, would be what? What would be common? Stone. Okay, stones were common. So a mass. Tumors along up and down, uh, some type of crush injury or, or uh, injury to the structures, the ureter, the bladder, the urethra, usually not so much in urethra, but prostate in men. Okay, so the guidelines, the definition uh, to meet uh, acute kidney injury is, are there these three uh, criteria. The first two are probably the more uh, used and the more useful and the more reliable. So the first one would be a rise in creatinine. It isn't a perfect marker, but it is one of the most common markers, easy to obtain, easy to follow. So a 0.3 milligram per deciliter in 48 hours over baseline. Or one and a half times the baseline creatinine value that increases over seven days. This is going to be important when we get to uh, ATN. Because a lot of the drugs work, um, don't show up until seven to ten days after we started using it. It takes them a while. The least um, valuable of those three are urine volume. If I fluid restrict all of you, you might have a hard time coming up with that amount of urine in a, a six hour period. So be careful of using it as your only criteria for the uh, determining a AKI. So it's an abrupt decrease, that's why we call it acute. Uh, and then we, we, you all already named that the etiology can be classified into pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal causes. The other reason I'm going back over this is that doc, uh, Professor Brooks told me that you all flew through this very fast. Okay, so I'm going back through it. Um, okay. <coughs> so pre-renal disease, think renal ischemia. So if there's ischemia, what does that imply? So you've got decreased flow to the, the kidneys. Okay, so many, many things can, can cause that. So the one system that I told you you just got to know is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. It, because in, in many cardiovascular and uh, Renal, it's, it's the cause, root cause of a lot of the problems. Or toxins are going to affect the system and, and cause uh, trouble or help, uh, depending on how we're using it. So again, just looking through this system again, if you've got a decrease in flow, you've got those juxtable barrier glands that are always monitoring the amount of flow through the kidneys. Then you have receptors up in the uh, heart that are doing the same. So you have multiple places in the body that are overseeing that. Even your hypothalamus is looking at your osmolarity and, and monitoring that. So lots, it's very important that we maintain a vasculature that can get blood and oxygen delivery to the tissues. Paramount. So multiple systems within the body are always monitoring that and making sure that we, if we don't have enough volume, 
that we can restrict to the most vital and maintain brain and heart function. Uh, and we can do things to try to restore uh, vasculature volume back to normal. So when you've got those decreases or hypoperfusion, then you've got your sympathetic nervous system is going to be activated. Uh, you've got uh, also activation of that system, so you're increasing your production of angiotensin II. That leads to your vasoconstriction also. And your angiotensin II, it, its job is, is also to do what? Two different areas, two other organs that it, um, it, it influences or affects. Adrenal gland. So at the adrenal gland, we get what? Aldosterone. aldosterone. So aldosterone is going to come to where? Where is it going to exert its effect? The kidneys. And it's going to, it, the kidneys are going to do what in response to aldosterone? Sodium. Sodium. Right. So we're going to hold on to sodium because where sodium goes, who follows? Water. Okay. The other place it goes is to the pituitary, posterior pituitary, and it increases the production of antidiuretic hormone, right? Okay. So we're going to hold on to water. So the big thing is we need to hold on to fluid to maintain vascular volume so it doesn't collapse and we don't get so hyperperfused that our tissues start to die off. So usually, in, in, in when we're not dealing with conditions that are uh, have outgunned our ability to restore things to normal, then this system can correct things back to baseline. It's when you get outside of that or you overwhelm the compensatory mechanisms that you then get into a disease or condition that then causes um, that can cause renal uh, problems. What we're going to see in, uh, from our end is we're going to see a drop in GFR. So the glomerular filtration rate is going to go down. Now, how will you? How do you know that just by observing the patient? <laughs> They're not urinating, so they, they, you can't produce a filtrate if you can't have if your pressure or your filtration rate falls. How else is that person going to look from a, if they're hyperperfusion? Uh, they could be edema. We're not going to talk about edematous states. Let's talk about hyper. Well, you can get it in edematous states. You can certainly be hyperperfused. If they've got a hyperperfusion, though, what kinds of symptoms are they going to show? Nausea. Okay, so orthostatic. Let's say they can't get up. What kinds of things would you measure or see? Okay, so blood pressure, you can measure blood pressure, their blood pressure can go down, heart rate can go up, what else? What if they've lost blood or they've lost a lot of fluid? What other things would you see? Uh, like tinting of the skin, delayed refill. Okay, so dehydration, so your blood pressure would go in there, your sunken eyes, your tinting of skin, uh, all of that would go along with it. Uh, they're also, what would their skin characteristics be? Pallor yeah. skin, so a, a, a decrease because they've got decreased perfusion. What about sweating, clammy? Okay. Tachycardic. Okay. So pre rate let's, hold on just a second. I can't see what I've got to This slide I threw in because it's very busy. Um, I've just added it in as another way to look at the uh, renal angiotensin syndrome. They've got some things added in here that the other one doesn't. So if you prefer it from a study standpoint or review, that's why it's there. All right. So prerenal causes. Let's walk through this. So a true volume de depletion, common. So you're vomiting up your, your guts and you have lost weight, you've got diarrhea. Uh, so if you've got a lot of vomiting, diarrhea, you're going to lose, you're usually going to have greater losses than you can take in and keep. So that could lead to dehydration if you're hemorrhaging, if you lose lots of blood. Uh, we over diurese you. Uh, so those are common things that could happen inside or outside the, the hospital. Hypotension. Uh, this could be due to um, 
being septic. It could also be due to um, uh, an MI. You can no longer have the myocardial function to uh, keep moving uh, fluid around the body. Um, Post-treatment of severe hypertension. So we use very powerful vasodilators, uh, like nitric peroxide. So it could be that if we um, if we overcorrect, then you could be hypotensive from that. Okay. Edematous states. Why do edematous states lead to that hypoperfusion of the kidney? <laughs> Says what? Okay, so movement of fluids into other compartments. What else? If you cannot pump blood at a rate at which the body requires, then what? Do, how did the kidneys? What is? What happens to cardiac output? It goes down. <coughs> So that means perfusion of the kidney goes down. So even though your volume overloaded, the kidneys perceive it as a state of, of, of not having enough volume. And so that's what kicks off that system also and, and worsens it because you have the increase in aldosterone in uh, ADH. Is this just review? I don't know if I'm pounding up um, something you already know well. Selective renal ischemia. So bilateral renal stenosis uh, drops, it will severely drop. Sometimes we don't know that in a person. If we give an ACE inhibitor, we can drop their uh, pressure so low uh, in the kidneys that we can uh, precipitate uh, acute renal failure. Two drugs that are really big in affecting uh, the hemodynamics in the kidney are the NSAIDs and the ACE inhibitor. Ours can, can do this as well. Okay, so if you look at this, I need bigger. Oh, okay, your screen is bigger. Okay. This area here, normal perfusion pressure, afferent arterial. Where is it coming from? Coming from the renal artery off the aorta. So it's coming from the aorta to the kidney, right? Yes. It enters into Bowman's capsule and an uh, extensive network of capillaries and also a covering that acts more as like a sieve so that you can collect and uh, filter out products of different sizes. Then your efferent. Is, is leaving. Here you've got resistance in this normally that is a tone that is maintained by angiotensin 2. The afferent arterial tone is maintained by prostaglandins. Remember prostaglandins are everywhere and some of the problem that we get into is that we use it specifically for pain or to prevent platelet aggregation but we also knock out all the good things that, that Prostaglandins are doing throughout the, the body. If you come down here with NSAIDs, what happens is that if you are using a non storable you're knocking out the prostaglandin tone that is being maintained in that afferent arterial. When you do that, then what happens to that driving pressure in the glomerulus? It goes down. You just don't have as much fluid coming in. Uh, and so your GFR will drop. This usually is not a problem if people are healthy. If we do it to you, it's probably not a big deal. You have so much reserve, your kidneys are functioning well, it is not going to be a problem. When you give it to somebody who hemodynamically is dependent on those prostaglandins in, in regulating local control of renal blood flow, that's the people who get into trouble. So often it will be people who have CHF that maybe is not uh, well controlled, heart failure not well controlled, kidney disease that is just borderline. That's the people that are getting into trouble. With ACE inhibitors, we're gonna, we are going to knock out the angiotensin II. Okay. So what does that do? So that lowers the, the resistance in the blood flow that's coming out of that glomerulus. By maintaining a, a tighter tone on that, 
what happens to hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus? It increases, so GFR stays up. So when you use an ACE inhibitor, you knock down the amount of angiotensin II, and so GFR drops. It usually does it quickly, and it can do it in anybody. So it's usually something that happens fairly, fairly soon after starting the drug. Questions about that? This is a good slide of just drawing your attention to it. It kind of goes through all the, the uh, summarizing all the things that happen when you get to acute tub tubular necrosis. So we're leaving pre-renal and we're moving into the intrinsic renal factors. So this is what happens in the kidney. So what you have is you usually have early, you have vascular injury. Okay, that's the endothelial injury. That leads to ischemia. If it stays, if it is severe enough and prolonged enough, then it's going to affect the epithelial cells of the lumen. Okay. And eventually they will die off and you will see them. How do you, how do you tell that, that that's going on? What kinds of things do you see in the urine? Casts. Cast. Okay, what are casts? It's cellular, it's debris, it's debris from tubular cells, white blood cells. It, they call them casts because they look like the, it's the tubule. So it would be like casting, you know, an animal leaves a track, you, you put down plaster of Paris, you did that as a kid, right? Yeah. Some of you, yes. <laughs> okay. So you're, you're creating a cast, that's why they, that's where the name comes from. It also is inflammatory. It's, uh, it uh, brings in white blood cells. Cytokines are released. Uh, and it sets up an in inflammatory state as well. It evokes the immune system. White blood cells come in. Uh, macrophages, uh, T cells, B cells. Uh, the body starts looking at all this material as foreign. So it is just an effing mess. <laughs> it is. Everything goes awry. The next, you think that's strong? <laughs> okay, well, for me. Okay. So I, I have to use something because you're you're all in. <laughs> this is a good. This is a really good picture to look at because it kind of summarizes visually what is happening in that um, in uh, ATM. <laughs> So here you have endothelial injury for whatever reason. It could be something that happened pre-renal. Severe enough pre-renal causes will cause acute tubular necrosis. So you've got some injury that is going along in here. So then what happens is the body will respond. If, you, if you're not getting good perfusion, then you set off that renal angiotensin syndrome system. So you get vasoconstrictors that are uh, that are released. You also eventually, what is going to happen is tubular effects. So what do you see there? That is an abnormal tubule. What do you see? Cells are gone. Cells have died. They've sloughed off. You see some of them are falling down through here. Okay. Think about all the things the kidney does. It starts to get disrupted. So you, you lose the ability, you can lose the ability to concentrate <coughs> fluid, the uh, urine. What about sodium? Those sodium ATPase are all along this border. There is a network. It is such a fascinating physiologic construction. You have these, these cells are very tight. They have tight junctions that, that keep them all together. They even have a cytoskeleton. They have these microfilaments that, that, uh, that uh, wind through the cells and keep them in a certain form. If they also hold those sodium, uh, potassium, ATPase pumps in place. When those cells start to become affected, then those, those the sodium, potassium, ATPase pumps are dislodged and they start to free float and they move more towards the center. Uh, that causes trouble in terms of the ability to get sodium back out. Calcium is regulated. Uh, acid-base 
uh, is regulated by the kidney. All of that goes awry. <coughs> And then eventually you get so much debris that you then start to develop those casts or you have further damage because you, you've now blocked up, you've obstructed uh, nephrons and their ability to do their job. Okay. So all of this is, is, uh, uh, is put into words in your handout. This slide shows you in black the areas of the, the nephron that are affected. So you can, and I'm not necessarily, you don't have to, to learn this, but you can see that ischemic injuries and toxic injuries can affect different parts of the nephron. The one area of the nephron that seems to be the most vulnerable is this one right here. So this is the proximal tubule. So there's Bowman's capsule, that little moon shape, <coughs> crescent shape. And then this is the proximal tubule. It's divided into three segments. This S3 segment <coughs> is the one that seems to be the most effective. Also, this ascending loop of a pinnacle. Okay. So these two areas, if you look here, and then under the toxic type, you see both of those segments. So those are the areas that seem to be most vulnerable. Um, under, I think under this one, I've given you, um, I copied, uh, this came out of New England Journal article, and I think I copied, it's, it's a very good um, explanation of what's going on. I don't know if I did it with this one or the next one. Uh, but you got it more detail, and it lines it out very well. Here's another little, this came from that same article. Again, here you have, this, is, this would be where the blood vessel would be running. This is the inside of that tubule. Here are those cells uh, that are being injured. It shows you the, um, if you look down here, this would be one of those sodium ATPase um, pumps. And here it shows you moving uh, to the, more towards the uh, lumen. You also see the skeleton uh, that I mentioned. Is, is falling apart in disarray. You see those tight junctions are being destroyed. So it leads to a phenomenon called back leak. So the material that what's in that lumen is meant to stay there. But what happens when you disrupt those junctions is that the fluid starts going backwards. And so it will leak back into um, like the vasculature. So that causes some of the damage also. This shows you injury, this shows you recovery. Given long enough, the cells can come back and regrow and reassume that, that architecture. Okay. Causes um, on the top of page uh, four. So renal ischemia, it sets it all off. Sometimes if we intervene early enough, we're not going to cause ATN uh, or if it's not widespread enough. Because you can have, it can affect the whole kidney, it can affect local parts of the kidney. Sepsis, common cause, and nephrotoxins. I'm going to go through some of these drugs uh, in particular a little bit further down. post renal causes we talk about. There are more obstruction, there are more things that get in the way, uh, cause back pressure, you uh, obstruct the ureters, kidneys get into trouble because the, the urine can't flow. Um, out. Okay, did that help? Okay. It is so complicated. The kidney is, is one of the most complicated, I think, of the organs. Here is, a, I'm going to show you two slides. The, this is a renal, renal tubule. So they've taken a tubule that's running that way and they've just sliced it. So we're seeing the cross section of it. So these are the epithelial cells, those nucleated cells. If you look at this tubule, it's lost it. It is, it's denuded, so those cells are gone. This is debris. Where you see those Ds, that is cellular debris. So a normal, here is a more normal. This is what that tubule should look like. Here's what it's looking like in ATM. This shows a recovered uh, uh, kidney from uh, an, an ATN insult. 
So what you see is, what they're showing you is mitotic um, activity with those little arrows. So the cells are coming back, they're dividing, they are reestablishing themselves. And you see the lumens are opening again. Talk about management. So I'm just going to give you an overall, overall, an overview. Uh, these would be done in the hospital. So the biggest problem, what what could kill the person? So the, there can be high mortality rate associated with uh, acute renal injury that's not addressed and becomes severe. The biggest thing is our volume status and electrolytes. And potassium is the big problem, along with calcium. So the first thing is to assess um, the volume steps. Are they depleted or are they overloaded? So the, what we do is going to depend on, on your assessment. So if they're volume depleted from either they bled out, you've overdiuresed them, they've been throwing up all the time, they've got diarrhea, uh, then we're going to give them IV fluids. We're going to give them IV fluids that we can use crystalline or colloidal. Crystalline would be like isotonic sodium or saline. Why would we use isotonic saline? What's that mean? What's isotonic mean? Same tonicity as the, the, the blood. Okay. Why would we do that? Don't damage the cells. What would be the other big reason? Where do we want it to stay? In the blood. When you put isotonic fluid in the, in the vasculature, it stays there. Okay? Remember all those laws you, you, you learned about the movement of fluids moves from high concentration to high concentration to low concentration. Fluid's going to move from a more, de, uh, from a high, uh, more uh, deficit, fluid deficit to a, uh, to, or it will move into a fluid deficit area. We want it to stay there. We want their blood pressure to maintain. Okay, it isn't going to carry oxygen, but it isn't going to cause them to collapse. It is going to start shutting down the kidney's response by going, I don't have enough stuff, so I'm going to give you more aldosterone and ADH. So it makes the kidney think, okay, we've got some volume here where we can stop all this other stuff. It's going to keep their blood pressure up, cardiac output up, okay, until you can get the blood going. Okay, so we're trying to keep cardiovascular collapse from occurring. So usually we're going to use this. I don't know how familiar you are with IVs and bags and all that. So this would be what a, a, what a normal IV bag would look like. It could also look like a, a jug. Um, and it's, we're going to hang it from an IV pole. Uh, and we're going to put it in. It's going to infuse into a patient with this kind of setup usually. If you're already familiar with it, then, then you're ahead of the game. Okay, so this is why we use normal saline, because when we put it in the vasculature, it stays there. It doesn't move into the intracellular fluid. If we give them dextrose D50 uh, or D5% uh, in water, it'll move into the intracellular. So there's a time to do that. Uh, but right now, what we need it to stay is in the vascular space. So that's what we do. So our goal of, uh, of um, therapy is we want to increase cardiac output, improve tissue oxygenation. oxygenation. Okay. So what are you going to uh, monitor? Well, you're going to look at you look at mean arterial pressure. You can look at their urine output. If their kidneys are getting enough fluid, they'll start producing urine. Uh, if you've got invasive monitoring in them, uh, then you could use that. You could look at and measure cardiac output uh, that way as well. How much you give is going to depend on how much they're losing and or how much they've lost and then what's their ongoing loss. Okay? Until you can stop the bleeding or whatever the underlying cause is. If they're volume overloaded, let's see if I have it. Oh, this is just another slide that I, is for explanation if it helps you. Okay. If they're volume overload, then we're going to use diuretics. 
And which diuretic would we use? We'll use the, the loop. Why do we do that? Hmm? They're the most powerful. Okay, so we're going to use loop and we're going to use them IV. Usually we, we get, we'll give them through the IV line, we can IV push them, which means very close to where the IV is, is going into the patient. There are ports along that IV tubing that we can administer. So when we do something IV push, that means we usually give it over a very short period of time, one to three minutes. Now, sometimes this is just buying you time effort. It may be that you realize we're going to have to dialyze them. So our, our end go-to is we'll dialyze the patient. If we can't control the potassium, can't control their volume, uh, or calcium, or phosphorus, whatever, or their metabolic acidosis, we're going to dialyze them. But that takes time. You can't just go, I need this person dialyzed. It takes people to wheel it up there. They have mobile uh, units. They'll get it up there, they'll set it up, but that takes time. So these things buy you some time uh, and buy the patient time. So a diuretic would be used. You could use a combination of diuretics. You might go back and look in CHF when we talked about uh, furosemide, we talked about using uh, diuretics that work by other means like uh, the thiazides. Uh, then we can use two of them if they're resistant to the effect. So if they're volume overloaded and we give them a diuretic and we are spot on with what we think is going on, what should we see happen? Urine yeah. yeah. output. Right. Okay. So that's, that would be one of your monitors. Okay. Hyperkalemia. That is a big one because the kidneys, that's, that's the organ that gets rid of it. And what happens when the potassium gets too high? Cardiac arrhythmias, also neurologic problems can pop up. The patient may have no symptoms. If you don't, you'll probably have them on a monitor, but if you didn't, they probably wouldn't have a lot of symptoms until something happened. What's the normal potassium in the blood? 3.5 to 5. five. Once you get about above 5.5, that's when I get nervous. 5.5 and above. People who are going to have a lot of problems with, with potassium are those who have a lot of cellular injury, a crush injury. Anything, because where is the potassium in the body? Intracellular. So if you do something that disrupts a lot of tissue, it will release a lot of potassium. If you are metabolic acidosis, what happens to the potassium? What happens in acidosis? Which ion is really, it goes up? What's an acid? Hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion donor. Okay. Okay, so what happens here? Lots of hydrogen ion, goes down its concentration gradient, right there, cell wants to maintain. Uh, neutrality, what does it do? It kicks out the potassium. It's got a lot of it. Okay? So when you're acidotic, your potassium moves out of the cell into the intracellular space. Now, normally what would happen is the kidneys would just get rid of that. But if you do it in a very short period of time and your kidney or your kidneys aren't working, then the potassium goes up and it, and it causes uh, trouble. We're going to see this in, in diabetes when we get into acute in, uh, diabetic uh, complications is they get acidotic, potassium goes way up. Their kidneys are working, they just get rid of it. So they get into a big potassium deficit uh, very quickly. Okay, so pot uh, potassium, um, if we can't control it, we're going to dialyze it. So that would be another reason to dialyze the patient. So what can we do to get the potassium down? Again, these are usually things that are for emergencies. The patient is showing symptoms and you want to get their potassium down fast or you want to counteract its effect um, or you're waiting for the dialysis machine to come. You can use calcium, IV calcium. It will mitigate the effects of the potassium on the myocardium. You can use IV insulin. 
insulin will move potassium into the cell. It's one of the problems we have when we get somebody in, their sugars are real high, and, they're, and we give them a lot of insulin, bang, there goes their, their potassium. We can use a diuretic, make them pee it out. We can use a, a cation exchanger. There's a couple of them on the market. Uh, KX, have y'all talked about those? Yes. So did uh, Dr. McNeil talk about them? Okay. Did he talk about the other one, the newer one? It's on the next page. Um, other, the other things you can do is limit if you're not in the big, um, if it's not an emergency, you can limit the how much is going in. So you're not going to give them an IV with potassium in it. Uh, and you wouldn't give them potassium in their diet. Uh, so we can use a binders. Cancelate's an old binder. It's been around a long time. Long time, 60 years. Uh, the problem with capsulate in all these binders is they bind the potassium in the gut. Uh, and but capsulate is not real specific for potassium, but it will do it enough that it that we use it. But it's also got a lot of sodium, so it, it delivers and, and can really increase the patient's sodium. Good thing with capsulate is you can give it. By mouth, you can use it rectally, which we do a lot. We just give them an enema, we make them a story, and we give them um, rectally. The other one is um, a tiramir. It is a it's a new one. It's only been out a few years. It's oral only. The problem with it is that uh, you can't use it for an emergency. But it's more specific for potassium than capsulite. And it doesn't have the sodium. So it's got some advantages, but it's big disadvantages that it's it's just slower um, to give an effect than capsulin. Metabolic acidosis, very common. You can't you can't uh, uh, control the bicarb anymore, which the kidneys are big with uh, producing uh, bicarbonate. They lose that ability, so we get into a metabolic acidotic uh, function that is causing us trouble with the potassium. Um, if it gets too low, it makes the myocardium more irritable. Um, so two things you can do, you can dialyze them or you can give them bicarbonate. Now bicarbonate can be effective, but it's got, what salt do we use it with? Sodium. So it is, uh, it's a huge sodium load. So people are already volume overloaded, you're just going to make it worse. People who are moderately uh, volume overloaded, but their kidneys are really shut down, you'll just make it worse. So, so sodium bicarbonate is a hard one to use. You'll note there that, what, what's the normal pH of the blood? 7.4. And what does it say to correct to? 7.2. So one of the things when you're doing a, an acidosis is you always, you never correct to normal. So we're only going to correct it back to about 7.2. Or it gives you a serum bicarb of 20 to 22. The reason for that is that it will, you'll overcorrect and you'll make them al uh, alkalotic. The body will tolerate an acidosis much better than it will an alkalosis. Uh, so we're never going to correct them back to normal. We don't have to. Uh, the body can, can uh, deal with that. Usually this is also a temporizing measure until you can dialyze them. Hypocalcemia. Uh, so they also can get hypocalcemic. They can't excrete the phosphate anymore, so phosphate goes up, calcium goes down. Um, the thing here uh, you'll notice is it says, uh, is to, if you're monitoring it, you're going to monitor an ionized calcium level uh, in, a, in addition to a total. So, why the ionized? This is albumin. Calcium binds to albumin. You've got low albumin, your ionized amount of calcium usually goes up. This stays in equilibrium with the ionized calcium that's in the blood, right? 
So what do you know about this free stuff? What's it do? It exerts the pharmacologic effect. So it can move into another space and exert an effect. So when, they, when you get acidotic, the amount of ionized goes up. If they've had a major, let's say, bleed, they may have lost a lot of albumin. Uh, and so the albumin goes down, ionized amount goes up, doesn't have enough places to bind. It's kind of like, what's that game? Musical chairs. The chairs are gone. There's no place to sit. So you have to leave. It leaves and causes trouble. Goes to the bar, gets drunk. Okay. So pH dependent, acid base. So hey, Keep calcium in mind. You've got to correct it if it gets um, too low. Uh, if we, if you have the, if you've got high phosphate, you, if you bind the phosphate, you can get the calcium under control. We're going to talk more about this with chronic, uh, when I, with binder. So I'll, I'll just leave that this section under under hyper. Phosphatemia, we're going to use oral, usually oral binders. Um, calcium carbonate is one, so Tums is a, is a common one, but there's other ones as well. Indications for dialysis, that's something I'm certainly not going to uh, test you over, but there is just a summary. The fluid overloaded, the potassium is not going to respond to uh, what you're able to do, their metabolic acidosis is very low, and they're uremic. So it's affecting their mental ability, their myocardium. Those would be dialysis. Okay. Questions? So what I would test you over is the management, not the pathophys. It is, wasn't my job, but what you said, I, I thought it, it, most of what we talk about won't make any sense if, if we don't go over that. Okay, let's take a break. Let's come back a little bit after two and we'll pick it up. Uh, at net, uh, net